All right. If you're seeing me right now, I just want you to say, hey, thanks, guys, for sticking it out. But thank you for sticking it out. Took us a few minutes to get going here. Thus, it goes with live streams. But so excited to be here. We've got uh, we've got some interesting stuff to take care of today. In fact, this topic, we talk about private 4G LTE on CBRS. You might understand all of those acronyms or just some of them, the CBRS one probably being the newest one. But in general, I am amazed at how many different conversations have come up recently where people are uh, talking about the value of 4G in the midst of what we know, obviously 5G is marketing us to, to pieces where it's coming. But I think what you're going to find out in this conversation here is that there's so much more that can be done with 4G that if, if there's any chance that your organization has some special needs, Wi-Fi is not cutting it, uh, and you're waiting for 5G, you might be pleased to find out that there's good things that you can be doing that are very mature, reliable, and answer a lot of questions you may have. I hope indeed that we can find some of that stuff for you today. So with that, my name is Rob Boyd. You are watching Tech 37, your home for technology, education, and collaboration. Let's go ahead and step over to meet our experts, shall we? Well, nothing like a little rocky start to, to get going, guys. So, Syed Chandler, thank you for hanging out. Appreciate uh, you also staying around as I figured out which buttons were the correct ones to push and get going. But uh, it appears that we are streaming just fine right now. And let's do this. Syed, let's start with you in terms of just introductions at the top. Who are you? What do you do? And... Uh, uh, and then I'll come back to you in a moment with some more specific, harder questions, shall we say. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, this is Syed Jaffrey. I'm the technical solution architect, or you could say NFV architect within Worldwide Technology, uh, primarily focusing on uh, telco cloud and mobility-based solutions, uh, which private LTE is one of them. So okay. happy to be here and uh, love to discuss more on the private LTE and CBRS. You got a drink of water or something with you? Because I, I am expecting to hear a lot from you. Not that I don't want to hear a lot from Chandler, because I've met him before. <laughs> we had him on a No Bad Wi-Fi special that we did recently. But Chandler, how do you describe what you do so we can characterize it? Because I, I love the the fact that we've got both of you here really representing some different angles. But I'll let you explain. What is it you do for Worldwide? Yeah, thank you, Rob. So I'm a technical solutions architect. My focus is IoT architecture. So that goes across all of the verticals that you know that we service, primarily in the industrials. So manufacturing, utilities, oil and gas. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about in previous episodes. Um, you know, all of this really comes together. Um, yeah. You know, as part of the architecture <laughs> that, that that I support and design. And really interesting, too, because both of you uh, kind of represent areas that I don't think enough people know enough about uh, in terms of everything that can be done for them. And because each time I've talked with either one of you, uh, I feel like there's a little bit of a mind expansion going on in terms of ideas for things that can be done or things that I thought weren't ready for prime time. And sure enough, people are doing them already. But we'll get into some of that. So, Syed, um, uh, with your background and in, in, in technical understanding of what's going on, and you, you got on me because earlier I had said, oh, we're going to be talking 4G LTE. You go, Rob, no, we're talking private 4G LTE. And you made it a point to bring that out. But I wonder for anybody that's not super familiar with these technologies, we've certainly heard the Gs, you know, in consumer cellular, uh, it tends to be the limit of where bulk of people tend to realize. But what is 4G <laughs> and specifically 4G LTE? to lead us into understanding why the private becomes an important demarcation there. Yeah, no, definitely. So, and you touched pretty much on a, on a spot on uh, place where what is the demarcation between private to a public 4G difference, okay. right? <clears throat> and so let me first uh, try to explain where this whole technology evolves from. Right. So the common thing between uh, across the technology of 4G and now even towards the 5G as well is that they both came from uh, a standard body called 3GPP that represents a, a large group of stakeholders, both from the telecom space as well as from the enterprise industry. Uh, the 3GPP it defines basically the, the mobile radio technology to be used in wide area networks when it all started for, uh, back in quite a long time back. Uh, for mobile operator networks around the world. Uh, the first technology that came from this group was the GSM, or sometime called the 2G, which really right. dates back to 1992, which was when the mobile phones became mass market, right? And 
<clears throat> and as soon as the evolution starts to happen from that point onwards, uh, we transition from 2G to 3G UMTS. And then in around 2008 was the creation of what we call today uh, LTE or 4G, which was the start from uh, the 3GPP release 8. Uh, this is basically what brings the high, uh, on top of voice, the high performance uh, data on those public networks. And really the whole idea behind the start of this technology was the need to bring uh, consumers and enterprises using a, a reliable mobile service on top of uh, of all the all the advancements that came uh, along with the with the 3GPP that brings on. Uh, however, uh, not only the uh, the voice and the and the uh, mobile data uh, was the target for it, but it was also there to support large number of users simultaneously, but also able to support mobility at very large or high speeds. For example, uh, high speed trains were, was the was one of the uh, the technology uh, advancements uh, that 4G brings. However, at that time, when it all started up, uh, voice was still the 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 focus area, and uh, data was not a, as an important player of the of the target for both consumers as well as the enterprises at scale. It was all started around five to seven years back when the ultra reliable high speed data requirement over the wireless technology came into the picture, which is when the service providers as well as the enterprises start focusing on this technology. And that is when um, the need for a private based network, or you can say the private LTE or private 4G network came into the existence. Uh, this was uh, the first time when the private LTE was introduced was during the uh, start of 2017, in February 2017, in fact, uh, during the World, Mobile World Congress, when the first trial of a private LTE network was showcased, uh, being the use case around the industrial IoT. And the, definitely Chandler can uh, chime in for that, maybe you might have heard of this uh, that particular use case, but this is when the whole mix of the CBRS, to the private LTE, to the private 4G, they all bundled up together to be showcased uh, live in that in that event. Okay, hold that thought because I'm going to stick on a couple of definitions here. So I think I was at that. Was that Mobile World Congress the one in Barcelona or the one in the states? I was trying to think. Uh, in fact, I missed that, that show. That was based. I think it was in the states in February the states, 2017. I'm not. I'm, I'm not 100% okay. sure. But, uh, Good show because well, it always amazed me because I love going to shows where all of a sudden this, the the detail of other industries that I don't spend as much time in suddenly just blows my mind and that's one of them uh, where a lot of big stuff comes out a lot of things around the world are centered around what comes out of that show and people are are holding back to showcase what they've done. Um, okay, I want to ask you in just a moment, but I'm going to go to Chandler first. But side just so you know where I'm going to come to you next, I was, I'm going to ask you in a moment about Wi-Fi evolution to support data and how that compares and where those may be converging in terms of uh, of what we know as provider networks uh, or cellular networks. But before we get to that, uh, he brought up industrial IoT, Chandler, and I'm I'm curious. So mm -hmm. from from your experience onward and what you've been doing, can you define industrial IoT? And, and when you explain to people what part of IoT you're focused in, mm -hmm. if that's even possible, are there certain areas that perhaps make more sense for just kind of narrowing the discussion from an IoT perspective, since that is kind of a broad term? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Rob. And, it, you know, industrial IoT is pretty broad, but uh, where I focus is really um, connecting the IO, the IO modules where you have sensors connected to- Which is not the, the same control. IO as the IoT. You're talking it's input a, output? Right. Yeah, it's oh, yeah. input okay. output, exactly. Yeah, um, just, just checking. So, yeah, so, the, so from a PLC perspective, you know, providing that, that connectivity path, you know, from a SCADA system to, you know, SCADA master to a PLC, historian to a PLC, as well as some of the, the input output, you know, modules that are out there, um, that's primarily the area where I focus. But then also transport, you know, transporting and aggregating that, that traffic back to a point where, you know, maybe some additional analytics are done or it's actually sent to the cloud. Um, these are areas where typically we've seen Wi-Fi or proprietary wireless technologies that are, you know, that are antiquated, that have, you know, really kind of lost favor in the industry um, in favor of something that's open standard and uh, yeah. easier to deploy and maintain. Okay. 
All right, well, so we'll come back to that. And Chandler, as we'd kind of talked about before, I'm counting on you to jump in because I have a lot of questions for Syed. And um, so Syed, back on the Wi-Fi, just understanding the historical evolution, because I think some of that becomes important to understand. Let me throw this statement out and you can correct me uh, and, and polish it up a little bit. But in general, what I've seen in terms of where Wi-Fi has been going in the last couple of years, um, it feels like it's starting to adopt technologies that were really perfected and polished in the cellular side where they figured out how to be much more, um, uh, what's the right word? I would say specific, but uh, declarative in terms of, of, you know, connectivity and who's got the rights to do what and who's in control of that, uh, that band or that communication. Um, what's important to understand about, because I, I feel like when people look at connectivity, they tend to think of, well, you got cellular and then they may be mistakenly thinking that 5G is also going to replace Wi-Fi suddenly. And that's certainly not going to happen, but Wi-Fi has its place <laughs> And then the cellular technologies around 4G have their place, and there's some pros and cons. What, what's important to understand about Wi-Fi's evolution as it relates to private 4G LTE? Yeah, and, and that definitely is a, is a good point because people sometimes do make uh, – it's kind of hard for them to do a demarcation between where to use Wi-Fi compared to where to use private LTE or private 4G or even the transition towards the 5G. However, just to give you a little bit of a background on that uh, aspect of it, that traditionally large enterprises have been deploying Wi-Fi to satisfy their uh, growing wireless data demand, sure. right? However, in, uh, traditionally, uh, Wi-Fi hasn't been able to guarantee the quality of experience and the seamless mobility that LTE by, by default for within the LTE architecture provides. And when I say quality of experience, you have the quality of service, you have the security that is embedded within the LTE architecture. Since it's been already there for, for a while now, a lot of advancements has been made in the LTE architecture to provide, to do a, a future proving security enablement. And we have all also witnessed that the the benefits that the public LTE provides, since I just touched base upon all these technologies that evolved from 1992 to from GSM to 3G to 4G now, uh, the, there's a lot of advancement and benefits that public LTE provides. So for example, the wide area coverage, uh, the voice and data communication, the security, the quality of experience, seamless mobility, all these aspects uh, are an embedded feature of an LTE. Now, when you wanted to place that into an enterprise in a smaller footprint, you, you just need to convert this whole technology into a locally managed, fully dedicated, and an optimized LTE network. That is really what private LTE okay. is all about, right? So uh, yeah. now, if, if, you, if you think that, okay, does Wi-Fi uh, uh, at one point overcome LTE or LTE overcomes Wi-Fi? Probably not at this moment. They probably will complement each other. Uh, depending on the needs and the requirements of uh, of the technology, you want one or the other or one along with the other, they both will work together. But just as a general rule of thumb from in terms of the coverage of a private LTE compared to the Wi-Fi is that uh, one and a general rule of thumb is that one LTE small cells can cover the same indoor area of two to three Wi-Fi access points pretty much with the the same output power that is being utilized by these different Wi-Fi access points. So definitely there is an advantage bringing private LTE into the picture because you have a lot of benefits that uh, the LTE can, can bring on the table. Uh, the ones which I just touched base upon all the uh, benefits related to the mobility, quality of experience, but also the power requirement because you require a smaller footprint uh, for the coverage area and to maximize the amount of users that gets connected with the with the max amount of throughput that can you can achieve from the LT. Okay. I was going to mention, because both of you, I think we're suffering from this a little bit, you're trying to hold that cost, which is horrible when you're on a microphone. Um, I think you've got to, if, if you want, feel free to, to do the mute thing on your uh, interface yeah. there. Feel free to let loose, man, because it, it'll tickle you forever <laughs> if you don't actually put something behind it and get it out of your throat or whatever. Uh, sure. Sorry, I feel for you because I've been there a lot. Um, well, okay, so this may be crazy talk, and I didn't. But uh, what would keep someone from a normal, what I call it, a carpeted knowledge worker business, assuming we were all going into the office? But it, you know, your normal office building, so to speak. What keeps them from maybe just doing, just bypassing Wi-Fi altogether and saying, "I'm going to do private 4G because I've got better uh, distribution and coverage and such like this"? Is it? Uh, I mean, I assume it, it's a different integration, but it, it can integrate with the data network. It, it's theoretically possible, is it not? Maybe, maybe it's happening. Is a that, lot is of that... complexity. 
yeah, complexity. a lot of the complexity. Yeah. Um, Familiarity. If you look at, um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, I mean, but if you really look at it, there's like what, uh, 10, 13,000, you know, parameters, Syed, you know, on LTE. We haven't really <laughs> seen a really good. Uh, we know, haven't dumbed it. We package. haven't dumbed it down enough for the for the market right, right. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, I want to deploy this and just you know kind of simple. Yeah, and yeah. it's not it's not that. But that's changing. You know, we're starting to see you know self organizing networks. You know, really taking that complexity out. Um, you know, really simplifying it down to you know cloud based. You know, solution where you can provision through the web and you can do all those types of things. A lot like what you can do with a Wi Fi controller. You know, where you yeah. actually you know manage and monitor that. So. That is uh, the complexity piece is what I've been hearing from my customers is, you know, the cost to do that versus I'm going to deploy a little bit more coverage for Wi-Fi made sense, you know, two or three years ago. But now it's a big deal. You know, it's a game changer. Well, now, do I understand correctly? You can go private 4G LTE if you're just sticking with this for the moment um, as a I can go to a service provider who can do it as an extension of their network. And it still is. Uh, you know, because they know what they're doing. It run privately. It's uh, nothing is intermingled. It's all yours and it's managed by someone who knows what they're doing kind of thing. If I understand correctly, or which is really what's coming into reality now. And we'll talk about this, but is you can do it on your own. It's getting more simple to do it. There's a lot more, uh, there's a lot uh, more people invested in making that simple as the market is now starting to pick up uh, or has been picking up. And that's where CBRS comes into the picture. Assuming I have those things correct. Um, what is the distinction, Syed, between what we're talking about with 4G LTE in and of itself versus on CBRS, which may need to start with a, a description of CBRS, which I found out the hard way has nothing to do with my, uh, I thought c- citizens band, my mind immediately went to college breaker, breaker. I think when I had a, I had a CB <laughs> radio in my truck. And that's how I would talk to truckers for some reason that was important to me pre-internet. We kids were desperate for communication. Yeah. Right. So, so let me uh, back up a little bit on that. So before jumping into the CBRS, I just wanted yeah. to touch base uh, about the mobility aspects of the LTE. Perfect. So yeah, since, straight. yeah, so since we all know that uh, public LTE has been deployed by these uh, operators uh, across the globe, right? So you do definitely have uh, an anchor point for any enterprise to kind of do a seamless mobility from one carrier to your private networks and vice versa. So for instance, if a user or an enterprise user is basically within the private network, it's called, you can say basically the uh, the inter-network mobility where you have the the ability to roam from your private network seamlessly out to a public LTE network being an anchor point towards that carrier. However, you also have the intra-network mobility which uses basically the same standard cellular mechanisms for any private based network. Now, this is where your spectrum comes into the picture because we all know that spectrum is an important part for any wireless network deployment. Uh, Frequency, channel bandwidth, power limits, these are the critical elements of any network design when you are placing either a private network or a public network, especially on the LTE side. So uh, Private LTE networks can be built using different spectrum bases. Either you can use or lease a spectrum from the mobile operator, or you also have the possibility to do a shared spectrum operating in the 3.5 gigahertz, which you just mentioned about the citizens brand radio service, which is the CBRS band in the US, or even on the unlicensed spectrum globally in the five gigahertz range. So there are different variances, especially CBRS is one of the most exciting development in the private LTE networks nowadays. And a lot of enterprises, a lot of uh, service providers, uh, even small service providers in the rural areas, as well uh, and as well as the small enterprise uh, and industrial uh, uh, operators as well, they are, they are going crazy with this CBRS spectrum because it's the reason for that is because it's a sub six gigahertz frequency range. So it has better propagation than millimeter wave, Mm -hmm. but also has a higher throughput than 900 megahertz spectrum, which is commonly being placed by these uh, uh, operators uh, around around the US, for instance, right? So uh, is there- No, go ahead. I was gonna bring up that, I was gonna bring up the spectrum slide. I'll do it now since I spoiled it anyway. because on this, just so you have freedom to go into this, as if you weren't there yet, don't feel like you have to. But it, 
what you're, thank you so much for backing me up into the fact that spectrum and the availability of spectrum is the huge differentiator in terms of why, why this kind of thing needs a second look. And if you weren't familiar, because it can kind of, for those of us who don't live in the industry on a regular basis, every time you hear about spectrum auctions or different things going on, it could be confusing because uh, I remember back when it was, it was first really, we're just talking about the electromagnetic spectrum. It's that same thing we covered in high school. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just where it's certain, you know, points on that, on that band. And of course they get smaller and smaller and smaller and, and how that's negotiated and the government regulates what you're allowed to do on those things based on what's happening with military stuff that already exists or other types of commercial interests and things like that. And, um, but when they open up something like this and you're saying that it's in a part of the spectrum that really enables, um, uh, a lot of good stuff to happen from a data transference perspective. Um, and based on the fact that it's clean and the way they're managing it and that they decided to do it, as I understand it, correct me, I'll let you talk again in a second, but is the fact that they're managing this, the, the, the licensing on this enables you to have much cleaner, something you don't get with Wi-Fi if, if people don't realize, but it's much cleaner, which translates to uh, a quality, a reliability, and a, and a bandwidth um, that you don't get elsewhere. But sorry, go ahead and correct everything uh, as needed there as you get back on track. No, no, uh, you're kind of spot on. Okay, on that. kind of, that's perfect. That's all I'm going <laughs> for is something in the area. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's good that you brought this uh, uh, this slide deck on, on, the, on the screen right now, uh, is that FCC, the Federal Communication Commission, has made 150 megahertz of spectrum that has been available on a lightly licensed and a shared access basis using three different tier models of what you can see on screen, right? The first one are the tier ones. And and just to let you know, this 3.5 gigahertz band has been allocated by the US military or US Navy. Uh, And and this is the reason why they got the, the priority over everyone else wherever they have the presence on. So the t- the, it's been divided into three different tiers. The first tier are all these incumbents where you have the, the US military radars, you have the US Navy in, uh, around the coastal areas of the US, you have fixed satellite stations, as well as uh, temporarily uh, you have the WISP, the wireless ISPs, who are now basically transitioning into the different tier twos and tier threes. But wherever they have these, uh, the presence of the US uh, military or Navy, you have the priority towards them for this particular band. However, you have other two different tier models as well, which FCC has allocated or even recently auctioned a, a, a spectrum for at least 80 megahertz for, uh, in fact, it's a seven, 10 megahertz channels for the priority access licenses, the PAL okay. for the tier twos, which is basically out for a three year term uh, contract. Uh, so it's been auctioned re- uh, around July, 2020, I believe. Uh, and it's been allocated to pretty much everyone who wants to kind of utilize it. Then you have the third tier, which is called the GAA or the general available access uh, for uh, for a spectrum of around 80 megahertz for a commercial use for anyone that has been managed through the SAS. And I will come back on SAS, but this is basically how, how they have divided these different tiers for the spectrum allocation. Okay. Okay. Good. There's, there's one thing I would like to add to this too, is if Please. you notice sure. on the top end, you've got 3,700 megahertz. So that fixed satellite station um, band from 3.7 to 4.2 is also... Um, in the process of being re, uh, re-engineered and, and reassigned where they're moving a lot of these satellite providers up to the last, you know, the highest 200 megahertz. So, you know, the FCC is, is evaluating another 300 megahertz of possible use and, you know, and allocation. Part of that could be for CBRS, but really for, uh, for these types of services. Well, and then while you're, while you're talking there, Chandler, what, what does it mean for some of your more, um, advanced IOT customers in terms of what CBRS offers for IOT based connectivity. Cause I am thinking sensors um, and such like this as an option, instead of having to wake up and do to some type of uh, yeah. other, you know, because there's a dozen different wireless technologies that communicate on depending on needs, I guess. Yep. But yeah, what is, what does CBRS represent? Does it unlock some things for you? Well, it, it actually, so I've got customers like in oil and gas, for example, that have tried to implement networks in the five gigahertz range you know, there's there's disadvantages to doing that. Propagation is is one of them, but also you know those bands are pretty crowded, just like 2.4 is. Um, from a sensor perspective, I think what we're going to see initially are gateways that 
that were maybe Wi-Fi based or proprietary had proprietary wireless backhaul um, go to CBRS, uh, you know, providing that a, a much cleaner and, you know, as Syed, you know, mentioned a, a better, you know, verifiable user experience. And if it's a machine user experience and you can, you know, track that, you know, with data, you know, and, and evaluate that. But I think we're going to see that um, in future releases. I'm, I think you're going to start to see narrowband IoT, which is on the, the public network side. I think you're going to start to see that show up on, on CBRS as well you know, between the guard bands or, you know, maybe as dedicated channels. Haven't seen that as yet, but, you know, I think there's a really good path there for gateways that exist out in, yeah. say, an oil field or in a manufacturing um, floor that will um, eventually go to maybe sensor-based. And then as we go to 5G, you know, there's a nice path uh, for that. You know, I, for that. I always think because sometimes IoT in some of the, my experience with it is it's, you know, there's smaller devices that are based on volume because you need to put them in a lot of different places and they don't need to communicate consistently. They don't have high bandwidth needs and other things, but you've got, because of the size of them, you've got battery sensitivity issues. Uh, and yes. so the, the technology they use and how they communicate and how often they're awake and stuff like that can make a difference. But sometimes also manufacturing them at a low price point to make them more ubiquitous is important. Yes. And those radios are cheaper in the lower, more mature bands that may be crowded now, but we're seeing people get pulled up out of, you know, we'd call the 2.4, the junk band from a Wi-Fi perspective, because mm -hmm. it's just so much contention. But the, as that clears out more and, and old, you know, microwaves and phone, 900 megahertz phone stuff die off, uh, you know, maybe that, that opens up things, I guess, for a lower price point for doing things, even though it's an older technology, it may be all that's needed. Um, anyway, I was just thinking that. Yeah, up. there's a lot of there's a lot of talk in, you know, in, in those particular areas. And, and one of the things that we, we with industrial, you know, IoT, you know, IoT, you know, industrial 4.0, um, a lot of the resolution of the data that we need to capture requires higher bandwidth, right? Requires oh, much more reliability. So if you're training a, a model, you know, you're doing some machine learning at the, you know, and you're, you're training a model, you need to make sure that you've got consistent data and, you know, there can't be any dropouts. There can't be any, yeah. you know, gaps in that. So there is an advantage to, uh, you know, yeah, you to got re you're working like with that. some high resolution stuff I, I, in the collection. When you talk oil and gas, I assume, uh, because there's huge money behind yes. the consistency of those, that data that they need across that time period right. or whatever. But Syed, right. I forgot yeah. where we left for off. The needle in a haystack. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ahead, yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, I want to touch base a little bit about, since we are discussing the devices, yeah. these devices definitely connects to, we are talking about private LTE or CBRS, right? So, we first need to understand even for our viewers as well, how this whole different components stitch together, right? To become a, an end-to-end -end architecture that is can, that can be implemented for enterprises. And then you can connect these devices with them for a seamless uh, a data transfer, right? So they're basically- yeah, get into that. Yeah, so they're basically three different core pieces that needs to be properly set up and connected for a network to function properly. The first being the radio access network, or you can see this LTE small cells. And this is where you basically manipulate the amount of uh, the technology within the radio uh, network, uh, by the utilizing one uh, technology that gives you a lower amount of bandwidth based on the use, use case or higher bandwidth based upon, uh, again, the specific use case for these enterprises. But then uh, a very important component within that would be the core network, which is called the Evolve Packet Core or the EPC that has multiple components embedded or stitched within itself that basically does all the packet data network tra transformation from all the way from the devices uh, to the to the gateways, right? And then the uh, one of the important uh, aspects related to the CBRS spectrum is the spectrum access service or the SAS, which is basically the the FCC has allocated uh, within the U.S. five different uh, companies to manage the SAS that basically allocates the 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 channel bandwidth for those uh, enterprises or the or the providers or, or the users of that uh, that spectrum the the first two components basically makes uh, of the LTE networks makes the the ma the major components of of this uh, of this network architecture but the RAN and then the core. okay the RAN, the ran and the core exactly but then the SaaS basically allows a business to utilize the CBRS safely and without interfering with uh, critical communications of government and military agencies. So that is basically becoming a, a third leg 
for the stool uh, that is kind of without it it probably would be very hard for managing somebody uh, this this uh, entire architecture over cbrs so while the small cells of basically they function similarly to the wi-fi access points these low powered radio access nodes are one of the important uh, parts of the lte network right since we just touch base upon the radio access network uh, phenomena uh, so in order to minimize the latency, the jitter, the and, and the other complications in order to achieve higher throughput, uh, they must be synchronized properly to perform the efficient handoffs between the cells and ensure high performance across different internal network architecture. Uh, one way to do this is to kind of use uh, uh, like the all the routers, switches, and all the components within the environment to have the uh, the PTP, the precision time protocol, being synced together, that basically provides you this timing sync. Or the other way is to allow each small cell to receive a strong GPS signal from multiple satellites. So, and that way, you basically be, basically be able to do a smart handoff between one cell to another cell if it's a mobility use case, right? Or even if not a mobility, but any other use case that requires the data transfer from one cell to another does require a, a strong GPS signal. Uh, to, to work properly or seamlessly. So both of these definitely will aid in the node synchronization within the private LTE network that uh, operates on the CBRS spectrum. So for those watching live, we're running a little bit longer than we normally would do based on if we had started on time and I hadn't had any issues getting the stream working correctly. But before we run out of time, um, and but be yet before we talk about what worldwide technology is, is doing to help people kind of turn this corner that are in that target market, I'd like to understand who this is ideal for. And I don't know if sharing maybe some use cases or examples, because I know CBRS <laughs> has been deployed. There are, um, uh, there are users out there that have, that have made that choice uh, that this is what they need to solve their issues. But I, as, a, as another effort to help people understand if they should be listening more closely to this, what are you seeing as the uh, you know, highest and best use cases to, that represent this technology? Yeah, so I'll uh, give a first crack and then uh, we'll You don't have to mention to names either, by the way, because that's always a sensitive thing. So feel free to genericize <laughs> it. I'm just kind of curious yeah. what what kind of businesses are doing these kind of things and why, why they're doing it. Or, you know, yeah, so with, with, with definitely with Industry 4.0, we are witnessing uh, the digital transformation in for all the industrial processes, right? So use cases like increased factory automation with uh, robotics, with AGVs, uh, with... Uh, uh, automatic guided vehicles with drones. Say, AGV, okay, automatic guided yeah, vehicles. It, okay. Yeah, uh, and drones, they, they are kind of the, the the upcoming new technologies that the industries are uses and that requires robust communication uh, with low latency requirements. So high bandwidth, low latency requirement is a must for operating these type of equipments in, in the field when you are trying to achieve a, a target, right? Uh, along with that, you have the warehouses with lots of video cameras that requires real-time video surveillance uh, that also requires high bandwidth and low latency requirements. Yeah. Uh, another example are the mining industry. So where you have your dedicated communication network is a must requirement for these miners who are hundreds of feet below the ground. Uh, that is one of the use cases around uh, for these private LTE networks to have robust uh, communication or, uh, hundreds of feet below the ground. Or, or uh, another industry would be the healthcare industry. So you have the hospitals, for example. Uh, the basements of those hospitals does not guarantee the Wi-Fi being the, the fully dedicated network. So private LTE can, since it can propagate signal um, very heavily, they, they can reach out to those unreached uh, areas that Wi-Fi can guarantee on those. Uh, the other one would be the transport transportation industry where with applications like uh, real-time surveillance. So for instance, uh, uh, the police is kind of uh, uh, utilizing this uh, at this moment for implementing private LTE networks for, for their real-time surveillance. Uh, along with them, you have the the passengers that are sitting in the fast moving trains or cars or buses that is also a use case for private lte so there there it's it's been widely uh, started to ad being adapted in different variances of the industries uh, as what we are seeing yeah it's interesting i'm hearing you say those examples kind of encompass some of the things that you said 4g lte is good at so whether it be roaming whether it be propagation mm -hmm. or penetration through objects based on where it's located um as well as uh 
uh, people, it, it feels like though in general, these all seem like examples of, of people who are saying this data is so important. I can't mm-hmm. afford to fight with anyone else, be it users who are just doing accessing their web pages or even other business interests. You know, there's a certain part of a business perhaps that needs a very guaranteed, predictable, always yep. on type of thing. And LTE, I'm using, I'm shortening the words, but 4G LTE is it's it has in private especially has the ability to to provide that. CBRS now has given the spectrum to that technology set that enables us to do things um, that probably we've been wanting to do. It's like opening up that door to stuff that, and so the stars are aligning, so to speak. Is that, is that reasonable? That, that is exactly spot on. Yes. Excellent. And yeah. the, the time sensitivity, I think is, is, is the big piece, right? You're talking about talk latency about when you say time or do you, when, when you say time, time sensitivity, like... right? So time sensitive, meaning the, the jitter and the delay okay. uh, cannot, cannot vary, you know, very much. Um, we're seeing this in, in the utility sector, you know, with smart grid and in some of the, you know, uh, power line, you know, where, where their communication of events occur, you know, with, with LTE, with private LTE, I can get that down to 20 milliseconds with the path to 5g, you know, we're looking at, you know, and I think it's rel 18, you know, we'll be able to see, you know, five milliseconds and then it's down to one millisecond. Right. And yeah. just to back up what Syed said. You know, time-sensitive networking is critical for you know a lot of the industrials, and they just can't get that with with Wi-Fi. Yeah. You know, today, so that's that's a it's a, a nice nice path uh, all the way to five G. Well, and that's my biggest goal for this particular show was to kind of open some eyes, like mine have been open in terms of this being, because I think we make the mistake sometimes of as soon as I hear the four G, I think oh that's almost gone. Uh, and it's nowhere near gone. It's actually still being invested in and improved upon. And then CBRS and the spectrum and how they're managing that spectrum suddenly opens up a world here. So correct me if I'm wrong, because I think I've, I, I was playing around with this concept earlier on, but I, you know, we've been teased with 5G marketing, you know, for a while. And, and that's great in terms of where we're going with 5G. But anyone that looks at the details knows that there's a long way to go uh, to really get the true benefits beyond millimeter wave and some other things that are, might be first out of the gate. Um, uh, but it seems like I, I would hate for someone to wait in their business for 5G saying, I just can't wait for 5G to get here because Wi-Fi is not meeting my needs and this kind of thing and go, wait a minute, have you considered this? Because especially I would imagine there's a lot of use cases out here that could directly benefit from for private 4G LTE on CBRS. And they just need to, op- they just need to engage uh, and say, Okay, let's run these use cases past. I bet there's a lot more out there that people might be artificially holding back. Is that would that would you agree? Yeah, that is that is that is where we can help our customers, um, you know, kind of pick through and and understand it, you know, and help relate what's available to their environments, and then help them prep, you know, their environments, you know, for these uh, you know for these emerging technologies, and give them a path to five G, right? But help them and be their partner and stand with them you know, as they go through that process. I mean, that's, that's what we do. You know, that's why we get up every morning, you know, is to, is to be there for our customers and to help them, um, you know, find the correct path, you know, and keep them on the correct path as the technology changes. I was trying to look up the URL because I only have it on the closing slide. So I don't want to put that up yet, but uh, let's finish up with this here. Cause I do want to talk about, um, we always tend to mention in here, the, um, uh, the, the briefings and the workshops that you guys do with worldwide, um, and, and Chandler, you and I have talked before about customers that engage you with very open-ended questions about, I've got from loose idea to a solid idea to a problem I need help mm-hmm. overcoming. And I've, I'm always amazed right. by your stories. We've got a special little, I, I, funny, I want to create a series now. If I didn't know that was a job um, to talk about, you know, where we interviewed <laughs> you and just talked about, and that's, I don't even know where to say that's going to be, but we'll have that um, Dirty available jobs. shortly. It's going to be interesting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's some strange <laughs> jobs, dirty jobs for sure. But Syed, where, what do you recommend in terms of engagement with worldwide technology? Anyone that's got a tickle saying, I need to check this out further. Cause obviously we never cover enough detail here, but what would you recommend? Yeah. So, so uh, just what you just touched base upon uh, the transition path towards 5g, uh, 4g uh, is today there. 4G will stay there until and will be the backbone for the initial 5G deployments. So uh, 4G LTE is not going anywhere, especially these two network, uh, the LTE networks. Uh, they are kind of very powerful tool to showcase or you uh, provide uh, the business connectivity for the field IoT operations, for instance, right? For any users who wants to or any enterprises who wants to go towards that. While 
just to touch base upon, while implementation could be a little bit complicated if an IT team, for instance, for those enterprises does not have the, I would say, the time or the training to create <clears throat> expert knowledge of the core networks and the, and the external issues involved, V being the WWT can help customers achieve their goals by helping them implementing private LTE network oversight, CBRS. We provide uh, lab as a service to our customers who wanted to know more about this technology. We sit with them, we get to know their challenges to provide them best of the breed solution that they that we have implemented in our ATC. And then you probably can uh, pull out that link later on with what they can uh, click and, and reach out to us so that we can help customer perform the proof of concepts, the field trials, and then take those solutions into the production environments by also leveraging or utilizing our integration centers, which is uh, the, the implementation at scale. So, yeah. so we can help uh, our customers in every way possible. Now that's perfect. And so guys, if you're watching this live or on the replay, definitely look for additional links in the information below that'll take you directly where you want to go. That'll make a lot of this, our inability or my inability to verbalize it. Um, I have one I'll put up on screen here in just a second when we close out. But um, I think the default behavior everyone should have is WWT.com. They've got, uh, uh, for anyone that's not aware, if you're not already a member and if you're watching this live, you probably have already got a subscription or it's not a subscription, you don't pay for it, but basically just logging into the platform uh, to opens up a world to see bios on Syed and Chandler to see uh, articles that they or their peers have been writing. It's amazing the amount of information that's being shared and it's also where all the access to these labs. You do not have to go to St. Louis, although it's well worth the trip. Um, not just because of the football team, but also because they've got an incredible uh, lab there in St. Louis uh, that is an investment of incredible proportions of multiple vendors. It's not about just one vendor funded mm -hmm. this and this is what we're doing. They're doing testing back and forth to say, how does this stuff can interoperate? And the one thing I think that's mm -hmm. helpful for anyone that's more familiar with enterprise like I am and maybe Wi-Fi terminology, you know, sometimes I think the biggest hump to get over when it comes to LTE is just realizing, can you help me, Worldwide Technology, understand that EPC core equals this and, you know, and, and uh, uh, RAN equals this? You know, it's because the technologies are the same in, in, the, in, the, um, in the high level sense, but we have different terminology from these different areas in which they've kind of grown over time, but it's not that hard and it's definitely well worth the journey. You guys are good Sherpas, so to speak, to uh, help us on that journey. <laughs> and um, I always learn a lot from you. So Syed Chandler, I thank you so much for taking the time to share this with us today and to our audience here. Thank you for joining us again. Check out those links below. Go get involved with the platform, engage with these guys, ask them questions and make sure you're not failing to over. Oh, I was going to play some music yep. behind me when I was talking at the end and I, I think it's, it's real lightly there. I thought it was a be cool, but then I forgot Thanks, to hit the button. So here's the music. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you on the other side, guys. And um, anyway, enjoy the rest of your day. I'll take care. Thank you very much. Take good really care. Bye -bye.